Hi, everyone. My name is Celia Hodent. I have a PhD in psychology, and I've been working in the video games industry for the past 15 years. I worked at Ubisoft in France. I'm French. Uh, then Ubisoft Montreal. Then I worked at LucasArts in San Francisco. Then I worked at Epic Games on a lot of things, including Unreal Engine 4 and uh, Fortnite. And I left Epic in late 2017, and ever since then, I've been doing independent uh, work. I'm a UX consultant. I'm specialized in games. And I'm uh, sad to not be with you physically, but happily we can still um, do this remotely. And so today, we're going to talk about uh, implicit bias and inclusion in the workplace. And uh, let's start. Um, okay, so I could show you a lot of data uh, telling uh, people why it's so important to be uh, inclusive and, and diverse in the workplace um, because it's um, making things better and um, companies that do that are more successful. I, I like to show this video because it's much more uh, telling. Um, it's self-explanatory, so uh, let's watch it. Nice. Okay, Noel, you try it out. One to your hand. Two black. Two black. Yeah. Come, again. Come again. Come again, Sashi. No, no. Come again, Sashi. 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 Come again, so it's funny here sort of because it's uh it's just a soup dispenser um but this is something that we see over and over again um even like for health devices and then it's it stops to be funny um because lives are at stake and so we know that uh, depending on the color of your skin things are not going to work in the same way uh, for you and this is why we need diversity um, because very likely the people who design this soap dispenser maybe they tried it on themselves uh and it's likely that it was a group of people that were mostly white and there's nothing wrong with being white but if you do not understand your biases and you build a product uh, just like within uh your own circle and uh in a silo this is what's going to happen. You're not going to realize that your product is not inclusive to everyone. And uh, if we have to think about money, then uh, it's not the most important thing, of course. Uh, but then uh, your product is not going to be successful uh, across the world, the less diverse uh, and inclusive your team is. So um, that's why it's very important. And the reason why I'm talking about this coming from UX is because when we work in UX, uh, we consider human factors when we design object systems and services, like really think about who is going to use the product. Uh, these people are humans. What are their mutations? But those humans are going to be diverse. Uh, and so inclusion is going to be really um, important. And in UX, uh, we are here to improve people's lives with technology and, and not the people who look like us, like everyone. Um, so it's really core to what we're doing. Um, and we also very aware that the way the things are designed are going to influence people. So if you see a door with a handle, you're very likely to grab the handle and pull. But now if the door needs to be pushed, it means that it's badly designed um, because the way you anticipate being able to use it is not the way you can actually use it. Uh, so UX is all about that, uh, thinking about how we can design the products so that it's going to be um, more easily uh, used by everyone and also make sure that it's inclusive and it's really solving uh, people's uh, problems. So in games, it's a bit different. It's, it's not a tool. It's not about solving a, an issue or accomplishing a goal. It's about having fun. But we're still thinking about all of these uh, elements. 
And so one of the uh, most important things that we have to keep in mind is uh, the limitations of, of the human brain and the human body. Uh, so when you think about designing a chair, for example, you're going to think about the human body and not the average human body, the human body in all its diversity, uh, so that the chairs can be comfortable for anyone. Or if you think about the design of cars, how it can be secure for everyone. And uh, sadly, it's not diverse here, and there are a lot of problems. We're going to talk about that later. Um, but we also think about how um, the the human brain is limited. And so that's that's my part. I come uh, from cognitive science. And th this is a very simplified representation of how the brain works and processes information. Um, like right now, like you're processing what I'm uh, saying. So it's mostly audio and um, a vision processing. Um, but this is just like really in a nutshell showing how it works. Of course, it's really simplified, uh, but it all starts with the perception. So there are a lot of st stimuli in the environment uh, and our senses are going to um, get all of those stimuli. So we have a lot of senses more than the five that we usually know about. Um, but there are, all those senses are here to um, get the stimuli from the environment, but also from inside our body. And then we're going to perceive Perception is like making sense of those stimula uh, stimulations. And then we're going to process uh, this information. And if we learn something new, it means that we're going to memorize the information. We can't really learn uh, if we don't memorize. And uh, memory is, is very complex. Um, the way it works is that it, it's changing physically something in your brain when, when you're memorizing something. Uh, new. Uh, we have billions of neurons. Each of these neurons in our brain is connected to up to 10,000 of other neurons. So that makes a lot of connections. Those connections are called synapses. And those synapses are modifying themselves all the time, depending on what we're doing. Uh, this is what we call brain plasticity. And of course, the more we age, the less plasticity we have. That's why, you know, learning a new language is more, much more difficult to do when you're 40 than when you're 10. Um, but still, we have brain plasticity up until uh, the end of our lives. Uh, and so that's very important to understand is thanks to this synaptic modification, we can adjust to the environment that is constantly changing. So from perception and a change in memory, there's a lot of things happening. Of course, there are a lot of, there are a lot of factors going to impact the quality of the information processing. Uh, you have biological factors. DNA has an impact. We have physiological factors. If you're stressed, if you are uh, hungry, or uh, if, I don't know, um, you are tired, um, this is going to change the quality of the information processing. Uh, what we're going to care about here is attention. Like we know that the more we can pay attention to something, the better we're going to process information and therefore the better we're going to retain it. Uh, so attention is something that we care about a lot when we work in UX. Um, so of course the brain does not work like that. We don't have compartmentalized uh, com uh, uh, compartments. Let's say that <laughs> that's a hard term for me. Um, that is working, that are working separately and doing their own things, everything works together in the brain. Uh, again, this is highly simplified. The brain is much more complex than that. Uh, but it's helping to um, have an idea of what we need to look for. And so all of these mental processes, like perception, attention, and memory, are limited. Like we have great capabilities, but we also have great limitations. I'm just going to give you one example, because um, the, the, this talk is not about this. But let's talk about perception. So if you look at this image, um, try to think about what does that make you think? You know, what do you perceive as in this image? Now, usually when I show this, I have a lot of people from the gaming industry or gamers, and typically I have like 30% of my audience is it immediately recognizes Street Fighter characters uh, and they're very excited about it. Uh, and then the rest of my audience is like, eh, I don't know, uh, they see just colors or they see maybe uh, DNA or flags or socks or um, something like that. And the reason why I like showing this is uh, because it's illustrating very well that perception is subjective. The, um, the way we're going to perceive this image is going to really be different depending on our knowledge on this game. If you played a lot of Street Fighter uh, and you love that game, you're immediately going to recognize uh, those characters just from this abstract image. But if you don't know that game very well, 
you're not likely to recognize it. Context is also very important in perception. Like, you know, I'm working in the game industry and we're talking about games. You are more um, uh, prompted to think about something related to games. And biology is also impacting uh, perception. If you're colorblind, uh, which is uh, the uh, the case of about 8% of the male population, so it's down to your DNA, uh, you are likely not perceiving this image um, in the same way as people who are not colorblind. And you are also likely to feel excluded from this example. So I apologize uh, to you if one of you is uh, colorblind, but it's a great way uh, for me to express that, you know, everything that you design can potentially exclude others. And that colors, like we never want to use colors only to express something. We can use colors, of course, uh, but we can use uh, texture and, and shapes or labels to convey what we need to convey. Um, so perception is subjective, and it's very important to re to remember that because anything we're going to design, whether it is a course or a video game or um, a hiring process, um, we have to take into account that uh, we are all biased in many different ways. So uh, again, you know, and I'm not going to do them all, but perception is subjective. Attention resources are very scarce. We are not able to multitask and we don't really pay attention to things very well. That's how uh, magicians uh, trick us. That's because we are not good at paying attention to what really uh, matters. And uh, memory is fallible. We don't remember things very well. And so because of that, we're going to make decisions that are actually are very biased, but we don't think it's the case. Uh, because that's the the um, the issue with those biases. Um, it's not that we have those biases; is that they are very implicit. We don't really realize uh, that they're here, and we need to be constantly reminded uh, uh, about them. And so that's the reason why, in user experience, we always you know, constantly <laughs> remind everybody about those biases, and we use um, ingredients uh, to guide us and, and we have a very specific process so that we can cover, um, like, uh, go around those biases. Uh, we take them into account and in how we design and the lack of inclusion in the tech and the game industry is also a systemic issue. It's, it's coming from the fact that it's people, humans that are designing things for a lot of other humans. And a lot of them are not uh, similar to them, and they are not realizing that's the case. And because everybody's biased, we need to understand how that works for uh, hiring and promotion processes if we really want to be inclusive. So this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, and let's play just a little game. Um, try to answer as fast as you can. So imagine you have a bat and a ball and a shop, and both of them cost $11 total. Knowing that the bat costs $10 more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? So try to reply very quickly. Uh, a lot of people answer quickly $1. It's not the correct answer. If you do the math and see that uh, it's going beyond, um, the correct answer is 50 cents. If you found the correct answer, good for you, uh, but do not think that, oh yeah, you're not biased. <laughs> yeah, you did good on this one. And you were aware that probably there was a trick and you didn't fall into the trap. That's good. Um, but the problem is that we constantly fall into traps all day long, all the time. Um, that's uh, That little question was part of the cognitive reflection test uh, that was conducted by Frederick in uh, 2005. And there were three questions in this test. 33% of participants missed all three questions. And 83% of participants missed at least one of those questions. Uh, so it's very present. Uh, and it's not that we're not able to um, reason um, logically. We can. The, the brain is perfectly capable of doing it. But the problem is that because of its very architecture, the brain is also biased. Like we, we try to... Uh, go straight for um, uh, for fast conclusions um, because in many cases, you know, we need to decide if we need to flee or or uh, to fight uh, against predators because the brain that we have today is very much the same that the one we had thousands of years ago when we were still trying to survive the savanna. 
Uh, so we had the same brains evolved for millions of years. Um, so it has not evolved that much uh, for uh, the past thousand years. Um, but the environment around us has, has drastically changed. And in his book, Daniel Kahneman uh, explains that uh, very well. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow, and it's describing um, what we understand about um, the, the the human biases that we have. Um, it's a summary of all the research that he conducted uh, with Amos Tursky. And what he explains, and again, it's simplified, uh, but it's just to give you a broad idea, is that the brain has two systems. And by systems, he means like two ways of thinking, like two modes, so to speak. Um, one system that's called system one, uh, and system two. So system one is fast, automatic, effortless. That's a system uh, that you're using most of the times, like the autopilot mode. Uh, it's the system for routine, for like very um, swift decision making, uh, for reflexes, for flight of uh, um, flight or flight response. Um, anytime that you learn something by heart, like for all the stuff that you learn through conditioning, like the beeps in your car telling you uh, there's uh, no more gas or you need to fasten your seatbelt, all of that is uh, system one. And your routines. So every morning, even, even though you're not entirely uh, awake, you can still take a shower, make coffee, or whatever it is that you're doing in the morning. Um, and so this is really the system for routine. Um, it's fast, automatic, effortless. Now, when we have to actually think about things, uh, concentrate a little bit, that system too that needs to kick in. Uh, this one is slow, controlled, and effortful. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, the brain is uh, represents about 2% of the body weight, uh, but it uh, eats up <laughs> about 20% of energy consumption. So it's, it's, it's really cons consuming a lot of energy. Um, and system two more specifically co consumes a lot of energy. So it's whenever you have to concentrate on something or to solve um, a, a problem that's this, that's outside of your routine, outside of, of conditioning uh, or reflexes. And the problem is that when system two kicks in, just like when you had to solve the, the little game from before, um, system one does not stay silent. It's still there and it's still there to try to make you make fast decisions. And so this is where all the biases lie. Um, and if we don't pay attention, if we don't know that there is uh, a trap, we're going to fall for it. And that's going to happen despite you understanding that you're biased. You, we're, we are still falling for them. So it's important to understand them, but it's not enough to understand them. We need We need to... Think about how, you know, what do we do now that we know that uh, we're biased? Um, so, you know, the, the brain is very good at making sense of a very, um, making sense of the world with very little information. Again, we have to make decisions very fast, but we're going to jump to conclusions when, you know, even like if we are not going to pay attention clearly to the things, so we're going to take shortcuts all the time. And we have to understand that those um, uh, biases are very much like um, uh, perceptive uh, biases. Like here, uh, the squares A and B are exactly of the same shade of gray. It doesn't look like it because the brain tries to understand, you know, perception is subjective. The brain tries to understand what's going on in this in this uh, um, picture. And because of the shadowing, uh, the brain thinks that, okay, yep, A is probably darker than B because B is in the shade. But if I remove the background, then you can understand that A and B is exactly of the same color. Uh, but it's not because you know that, that you stop being biased. Like if I put the background again, now you're perceiving again that A is darker than B, even though you know that is not the case. And that's the same thing with uh, cognitive bias. Even though you can understand your biases and you know they're there, you're still going to fall for them. And we have a lot of biases. <laughs> so this is the cognitive bias codex that you can find on Wikipedia. And it was an effort to try to visualize all the biases that we have and to categorize uh, them in different um, in different sections. We're not going to go through them all. I just want you to feel overwhelmed by this image because those biases are overwhelming. Uh, but a lot of them are just revolving uh, around the fact that we don't pay attention to things well. We don't memorize well. Um, we perception is subjective. Like all of these things that we talked about um, earlier. 
So just a few examples. We um, have, for example, the decision, uh, a decision-making bias uh, that is called availability heuristic. Um, so that's a tendency to overestimate the likelihood of an event with greater availability in memory. Um, so for example, if you are going in Australia, like people always <laughs> scared of uh, the, the animals in Australia um, and sharks could be one of them. Um, and people are going to think about sharks uh, a lot of times. Although on average, sharks kill about five people per year. Um, that's not a lot. And millions and millions of people swim in oceans where sharks are. Uh, so most of the time, they're, you know, we are more of a danger for them than they are for us. Now, of course, if you have a shark attack, it's it's really not, not cool. And it's very um, uh, stressful to see that those images. Um, and of course, it's it's uh, scary. But the we think about it much more than how it is uh, representative statistic, statistically. You know, is it going to happen to you? Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Um, and on the other hand, we don't think too much about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes kill about. 700,000 people a year uh, through malaria and other um, diseases. Um, and again, the problem is that every time that someone is a victim of a shark attack, that's going to make the news. Uh, so it's much more available in our memory because we're going to read about it every time that happens. Um, so the media has uh, some weight there um, because if uh, every time that something happens, uh, even though it's not very frequent, we talk about it a lot in the press, uh, then you're going to think that this is really happening very frequently when it's actually not. So that's what we call the availability uh, heuristic. Now, think about it for problems like um, uh, like uh, crimes like uh, rapes. Um, if you look at the statistics, uh, women are much more likely to be raped by someone they know. Um, it's very likely that's going to be uh, their uh, spouse. Um, but when some politicians and sometimes that people try to manipulate others, they're going to really put forward the very few examples where women have been raped by an immigrant, for example, because they want to scare people and they, you know, they have a political agenda here. And so if you are being repeated, a lot of time that this is the problem uh, and these are who the rapists are, uh, then you now, now believe that immigration is a big issue, Where whereas if you look at the numbers, it's not. So the availability heuristic is, is a very nasty one uh, and the press has a, a big impact on it. And of course, uh, politicians and any people who has a voice, uh, they can uh, manipulate you know, the things that we have more available in our memory. That's going to change our decision making. Um, so for example, maybe people uh, will prefer to drive rather than uh, fly because they fear about um, a plane crashing, but you're much more likely to um, die in a, a car crash than uh, um, in a plane crash. So that's another example of the availability heuristic. Um, there's also a lot of things around attribution the theory, so how we assign causes. Um, so stereotyping is a big one. Uh, we have a tendency to attribute certain thought of behavior to a group of individuals and therefore over generalizing. Uh, so if we see a woman that sucks at math, I'm at math, um, we might have a tendency to say, wow, well, like all women suck at math. So that's stereotyping. <laughs> uh, so we, we know that very well, but this is something that happens a lot. And it has a, a big impact on what we call the fundamental attribution error. Uh, so this is when uh, we explain the behavior of someone as being due to internal traits rather than external traits. So for example, if you're late for work, um, there are different reasons for that. It could be because you didn't wake up, uh, so that's internal traits, like you didn't really prepare, uh, or you didn't wake up early enough, you didn't really think about traffic or um, problems with transportation, and you arrive late, that's because of you. Uh, but it could be also because of external uh, um, context, maybe 
uh, your child was sick when you woke up and you had to take care of them, or maybe there was a strike that was not um, prepared, or maybe there was an accident uh, in the subway, and, and so now you are late, but because of external uh, issues. Now, because of stereotyping, um, we have a tendency to explain behavior of others that, you know, the others um, due to internal traits. Like, for example, if we think about immigration, which is something that we hear a lot, um, let's say, like, put a, a marginalized group into those brackets. Oh, this person is late because, you know, these people are lazy. Uh, so that's the fundamental attribution error that feeds a lot on the stereotyping. Um, there's a lot of problems <laughs> when we are evaluating people in, in a hiring process. And HBR, so the Harvard Business Review, um, explains a lot of uh, those research um, uh, fairly well. So we know that, for example, um, there's there was some research conducted with just the same resume that was sent to people who were hiring. And for the same resume, they were just changing the name. And the name could be sounding more masculine or more feminine or sounding uh, more like um, foreign or sounding like very American or very French or like pick the country uh, where you are. And from the same resume, like people were not selected in the same way just because of how the name sounded like or because of the address maybe there the address is coming from an area that you know like there's a lot of immigrants or uh it's a lower socioeconomical um area and so we make decisions based off of that without even us realizing um and there were a lot of uh, research conducted um between men and women but also um between like the um the marginalized groups uh, like for example in the west would be like black people uh brown people like people of color in general uh, and we see that for the same set of skills um a white man will be uh, uh, evaluated as being modest, resolute leader during the interview, whereas for the same skills, again, um, a woman or uh, people of color would be um, estimated as being unassertive, arrogant, or aggressive. So this is something that we hear a lot like, as, as a woman, uh, the aggressive one is <laughs> something that comes uh, uh, fairly uh, frequently. Um, like, like every time we, we need to be um like uh, assertive um it sounds like we're being aggressive or women are going to be um uh cataloged as being emotional as if you know men didn't have emotions um so these are issues that are reflected during the hiring process another one this is a really really important is the um, so social bias example this one uh, this time is the in-group bias so we have a tendency to give preferential treatment to others we perceive as belonging to our own group uh, so we we are part of different groups and again this is just perception there's nothing biological behind this uh, so for example i am a woman i am white i love music i love video games so if i uh, meet someone who um, has the same sort of traits uh, that i perceive are similar to mine i'm gonna feel uh, more comfortable with that person and i'm gonna give a preferential treatment to that person against others that I would perceive outside of my group. And this is becoming to be backed up by neuroscientific evidence. Like people process information from a perceived in-group differently from a perceived out-group. So from, it was uh, quotes, uh, inspirational quotes that people had to read inside the MRI. Um, and sometimes the quote were presented as from a political leader that belongs to your group. And then you would have the same quote, but then it's presented to you as being from a leader from outside your group. So the quote is the same, but if it's presented as if it's from your in-group or your out-group, the brain does not light up in the same way. Uh, so it's very profound. And again, this is something that is implicit. We do not realize that we're doing this. 
Like, like people are going to be defensive. Like, I, wait, no, I don't, I don't do that. You know, I don't see color, whatever it is that we say. Um, and no matter how hard, you know, we think we're not doing it. Uh, we, we are. And this is really something that is um, very human uh, to do. And so uh, the problem is that if you're a, a white man um, and you're hiring, it's not because white men are, are bad. You're not inherently bad. It would be the same problem with the same group of people who are in power of making decisions. So if you're in power of making decisions and you're white men, even if you try to be diverse and to be inclusive, you're going to see a lot of different people and probably, you know, you know, you know, try to make an effort to be inclusive. But then you're going to find someone who is maybe coming from the same school um, and, and you know, you have some connection with them. And this is one that, oh, yeah, it clicked with that person, have a good feeling with that person. This is when the this in-group bias creaks in and all these uh, other biases that is uh, that are influencing our decisions. Because yes, it, it is more comfortable and we feel more comfortable with people who look like us. It's it's natural to, to be that way. It's very human. But we cannot have an inclusive world if we do not realize this. Um, because all of a sudden, you're going to realize that you look around you and now all of a sudden, like 80 or 90% of your company or your team is homogeneous, depending on who is making the decisions. So if we're in the West, it's very likely that the people at the top are white men. Uh, and so now around you, it's going to be very homogeneous. You're going to be a lot, uh, having a lot of white men. And when we say that, uh, if we look at the game industry, we can look at the statistics that we get, for example, from the IGDA. They run a developer satisfaction survey, and, and, and so they get a lot of data uh, from it, coming from the game industry. And from the 2021 survey, they found out that 78% of game developers are white, 62% identify as men, and 63% have no disabilities. Uh, so most of the respondents were in the West. And so what we are seeing here is that the industry is overwhelmingly white and male, uh, as Tanya de Pass uh, says. Um, and so once we understand this, and again, is there's nothing wrong in being a white man. This is not what this is about. It's just about understanding that those biases exist, the in-group bias exists. And so if you have a population that happens to be in power, well, this is just going to perpetuate this issue. And the problem also when we talk about inclusion and diversity, and we try to make people realize, hey, you know, you're there's a lot of people that look like you in your team. Uh, the problem is that we're gonna get defensive, and that's mostly coming from cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dif dissonance is when conflict, conflicting attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors are producing a feeling of mental discomfort. Let's say you consider yourself as a good person, uh, as progressive, that you, you want to be inclusive, and then someone points out that, yeah, okay, but look at around you, your team is mostly white. Um, that doesn't feel good. And uh, and again, because of the fundamental attribution bias, uh, when something is happening to us, we're going to have a tendency to put it from outside uh, reasons. Um, well, it's not my fault. Uh, we, we did try to hire more women or more people of color. Uh, but just, we just happened that uh, we mostly have uh, resumes from, from uh, white people. Uh, and so we're going to you know, or we're going to say, well, we had a very specific process and we did our best. And yes, it's probably the case, but it's also probable that all the decisions that you made throughout that process was biased in such a way that maybe you just like posted your, um, uh, your job description on areas that are mostly where people like you go. Um, maybe use some words that are discouraging for uh, other people. There's a lot of small decisions that we're going to make or like, because of the in-group bias, like you saw someone that that's sounding a uh, name that sounds uh, familiar to your in-group. Uh, we're going to judge that person uh, in, in a way that is more lax than someone else. And so uh, that kind of distance is here and, and again it's 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 a good way to survive like because if we uh try something and it doesn't work like um 
the fox trying to get grapes and uh, trying to get the grapes, but they are too high. We're going to say, well, okay, well, they're probably sour anyway. We need this cognitive distance to keep going. And because otherwise we'd be just, it would be excruciating every time we fail at something. Um, so we need to realize that this is this is real and we're having this. And that's why a lot of people say, well, we have it's okay to be uncomfortable talking about diversity and, and diversity issues. Uh, we will be uncomfortable and that's okay and we can talk about it. Um, but if we want to move forward and have more inclusion, especially in the game industry, uh, we need to realize what's going on there. So if we want to go further, um, you can read these books. Invisible Women is a very good book. It explains how the world has been designed by men. And again, they're they're not trying to exclude uh, women, but they just happen to not think about certain things. Uh, like, for example, in cars, uh, there was, I'm mentioning like how you make cars um, uh, safe for everyone. Well, it turns out if you're not an average male, uh, you are much more likely to get hurt in a car accident. Because like uh, until very recently, the the cars were uh, designed. Um, they were using um, dummies that were like having like the average male, so average height for a male and uh, average uh, weight. So if you're not, so if you're uh, not a male, and if you're not an average male even, um, this is not designed for you. And so we, it's really important to understand those biases. And, and again, the, the people who design. All these objects around us, they, they don't try to exclude everyone. Um, but any decision, any design decision will potentially exclude people. And if you do not have a specific process to identify those barriers and take them down, they're going to be there. And so you are going ex to exclude people. Um, and Daniel Kahneman, uh, so the researcher who uh, wrote Thinking Fast and So, which is also a book that I highly recommend, um, he says that people who are cognitively busy are more likely to make selfish choices, use sexist language, and make superficial judgments in social situations. Because when we're busy, you know, we're not going to be able to make the extra effort to like think about our biases. Like, every now and then, maybe we're going to try to uh, check ourselves with our biases. And if we are in a calm situation and we're relaxed and everything is well and going on uh, perfectly, maybe we'll be able to identify that in ourselves. Truth be told, we are more likely to identify that in others than we are in ourselves. Um, but when we are cognitively busy, we're stressed, we have a very tight deadline, forget it. We're, we're not going to be able, like, it's too much um, uh, mental load. We're not going to be able to take that into account as well. If you look at the game industry, the tech industry, it's typically a very cognitively busy industry. Uh, a tight deadline, there's a lot of fires to extinguish. Um, so that's really not helping uh, to work with it. So humans are biases and, and we're not good at checking ourselves. Like even if you understand the biases and, and you're ready to have uncomfortable <laughs> discussions about, you know, how those biases are impacting um, our processes that we put together, uh, we're not going to be able to go beyond them. Um, and so because we're too biased in a way that is implicit, uh, we're not going to be able to, to do that. So could AI since they're not humans, could, could AI help humans fight biases? Well, I'm sure you already know that answer to that question, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to give you an example that is older uh, because it's very telling. Uh, so it's this is not happening anymore. It's been fixed, uh, at least for this. Um, so in Google Translate, if you take English to Turkish, uh, you have an interesting thing here going on. So in Turkish, I do not speak Turkish, and I'm going to try uh, to pronounce it properly. Um, but in Turkish, you do not have gender. So for example, he is a doctor and she is a doctor is going to translate in the exact same way, obir doctor. Now, if you take obir doctor in Turkish and translate it back to English, all of a sudden you had a um, masculine pronoun put in there. Now, if you take the phrase in Turkish uh, that is relating to nurse, so it's obir emşeri, now, all of a sudden, it's a feminine pronoun that you have. She is a nurse. So this is very well illustrating the problem with AI. It's fed on what's going on in the world. It's, it's fed on, on human activity and humans are biased. And the internet is certainly not inclusive. Like, think about who are the most people contributing to what's going on on the internet. 
it's certainly not as diverse as we might think it is. Um, like, look at the numbers, like who's contributing to Wikipedia? <laughs> You'll be surprised. Um, well, maybe not. Um, another example, um, Amazon was trying to put together an AI to remove human biases as they were recruiting. Uh, and they had to stop uh, this experiment because it turns out the human was even more biased than the, the, the humans. Um, because the AI found out that one of the best predictor to get hires is to be a man. <laughs> and so when they were like the AI was analyzing uh, prior resumes, and so the AI was pick t picking up, you know, maybe if you put in your resume that you are um, in a women in gays, for example, and then the AI deducts that you're a woman and deducts that you're not likely to get the job and your resume is uh, put into the trash. Uh, so they had to stop it. <laughs> Gay went very badly. More recently, of course, if you look at uh, chat GPT, uh, it often relies on gender stereotypes uh, to choose pronouns. So if you are um, uh, talking about kindergarten uh, teachers, most likely it's going to be a she, whereas a uh, mechanic or investment um, or a construction bucker um, is going to be a he. And you know, investment banker, a lot of them is going to be they. And the AI is like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to make an assumption here, but still like, for 20%, yeah, it's going to say he. Um, and so like, we have a lot of examples of that. You know, if you ask ChatGPT to tell a story about boy and girl, girl choosing their careers, the boy becomes a successful doctor and the girl, a beloved teacher. There's nothing wrong in being a beloved teacher, teacher, but the problem is that now we categorize people in certain categories. And if you're a boy, you should be able to be a beloved teacher. And if you're a woman, you should be able, uh, to, uh, become a successful doctor. This has nothing to do like our skills in becoming a teacher or a doctor has nothing to do um, with our uh, DNA. If you are using LLMs and AI in general, you should know the work of Timnit Gibru. Um, if you don't watch her talks, like for example, this one, uh, it's highly informative and you can understand all the, the problems in AI and how they make decisions for us and they're going to exclude a lot of people. Um, so again, if we are thinking of a soap dispenser, it's not too big a deal, even though it's still annoying. But now if you're thinking about who gets uh, a loan for buying a, uh, a house and if the AI is going to make the decision or who's going to get uh, um, move, uh, move forward in the hiring process, if this is uh, taking uh, into the hands, hands of the AI, now it's it's creating much more issues. So we see that AI is actually gonna uh, perpetuate uh, biases even more so than humans. And in a way that we are not necessarily aware because um, the model's blind spots reflect the judgment and priority of its creators. But the AI is a black box. So it's biased in a way that we don't even understand and we can't debug. So to look into AI, I uh, highly recommend uh, those books and groups of people. Um, please, please, please look into that if you're using AI. It's, it's really, really important. Okay, so if we cannot rely on our, you know, our own will to be more inclusive and we can't rely on AI, what can we do? What, what we have to do is to purposely redesign the environment, our hiring process, our services, our games, to account for our biases and make society more inclusive. It has to be an effort um, that is carefully thought through. Uh, so here's an anecdote. Uh, it's not solving for everything, and it's not a perfect academic uh, example, but it's a, it's a good story to tell. If you look at the uh, orchestras back in the 70s in the US, they were mostly predominantly males. Uh, what's up with that? Maybe women cannot play music as well as men. Well, it turns out that the people who are recruiting uh, the musicians were mostly men. And again, because of the in-group bias, they had a tendency to judge more favorably men against women. So what they did at some point is to have blind auditions so they could not see the person who's playing and they were just relying on audio. And as they did that, uh, much more women were hired in orchestras. Um, they had to iterate um, because at some point there was no um, carpet. Uh, and so if some people were having high heels, we're going to make an assumption that's more likely a woman. Uh, and that's and then the ingrobias is going to kick in again. Uh, 
Uh, this is not solving for everything. This is just an example of how we can go around the anger bias. Um, but now if the society is um, made in such a way that if you're a person of color, for example, you do not have access to music education as easily as if you're white or if you're in an area um, that is promoting music, that's not going to solve the problem that during the recruitment, you're going to have more white people than people of color. So it's not solving for everything. Right? Let's not stop there. But this is just one example uh, to go around one of these biases. And that's why we're going to need to iterate. There not, there's no way you're going to be able to do that overnight. Um, it has to be thought through. And we have to realize that we're going to fail, just like at the beginning, like not putting a carpet in there. Um, that's not going to work as well. And that's okay. Uh, we need to move forward and try things and see, you know, what's working, what's not working so that we can keep going. And that's the design thinking process that we use in UX. We have iterative loops. We think about something, we test it out with real users and we look at what's going, what's working, what's not working. Then we go back to the drawing board and we um, make it better. And then, you know, we iterate through that. So we have to be ready to fail and be okay with that and not stop there, you know, keep going so that we can perfect the, the system. And so that's why UX is so important uh, in that process because we understand, I mean, we're, we're humans too. So we don't do not rely on opinions. Uh, we actually rely on science. That, that's why you know, human, um, UX process is human-centered and grounded in science. We have a specific protocol uh, so that we can try our best you know, to um, uh, go beyond our, our biases. It's a collaborative process. It's not just the people with UX in the title. That everybody has to um, be mindful of understanding that your decision and in what is it your design is potentially going to exclude people. And it's benevolent. We are here to improve people's lives with technology. So ethics, accessibility, and inclusion are really center to what we um, the, the center part of what we do. Here's another example of how you know redesigning things can change behavior. Uh, it's uh, more on the uh, funny side. Um, that's uh, describing the book nudge. Um, a janitor in the Amsterdam airport was tired of cleaning <laughs> everything and just telling people, "Hey, be careful! You know, uh, keep the place clean. It's not working very well." So what he did instead is is he um, he put a, a sticker of a fly next to the drain. And all of a sudden, uh, apparently you guys are very playful, um, people were aiming at it. And therefore there was less uh, urinal spillage in the restroom. So this is more on the fun side, um, but it's another example. Uh, that's why we talk a lot about behavioral psychology um, to redesign the environment and try to make sure we think about how things are designed so that we can um, uh, accomplish what we're trying to accomplish now. What are we trying to accomplish has to be a decision from everyone. Like who decides uh, what needs to be done? Like here, I think we can all agree that having a clear, a clean bathroom is good. Uh, but now, if you think about healthcare for everyone, you know, like uh, politics. Now, who decides, and you know, who's included in the discussion? All right, so there's no such thing as a neutral design. Uh, any design is going to influence users and potentially exclude some of them. And goes even like for uh, something as silly as uh, icons that we use. Uh, the icon, uh, uh, the light bulb, means in the West, idea is definitely not uh, universal. So the icons that we're using, if you're trying to reach out uh, to a global audience, are also very important. And so it's time we need to understand um, that if we want inclusion and, and equity, we have to think about how to redesign the environment. And you see probably those images every now and then. And the problem with those images is that they uh, suggest that the uh, the inequalities are just, you know, the state of the world and just down to biology. Uh, it's not. Like in reality, inequalities um, in opportunities are, are not natural. It was designed by humans. Like everything that you see around you is, is mostly designed by humans, like the academic process, uh, the hiring process in the company, all that was designed by a human. Those humans are biased. And so they create some inequalities. And that's why by really redesigning all of that, it's not about correcting nature. It's about correcting uh, the flaws that we put in there originally. 
So inclusive gains in society won't happen solely with good intentions. They need to be intentionally designed to be inclusive. So in games, uh, if you're interested in that, I invite you to look at ethicalgames.org. Uh, it's an initiative and an effort to make the game industry and games more inclusive. Um, things to do <laughs> there. Uh, and yeah, so the idea is to, if you want to change the world, uh, let's redesign the box uh, and, and stop, you know, pointing fingers at people. Uh, sure, we need to realize that we're biased and and go beyond that and go beyond that discomfort. Uh, but then what's going to really work is to think about how the process makes us fall into our biases and how we can redesign it differently. Well, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I hope that this was enlightening and not too uncomfortable. If you want to go uh, further in uh, UX and games, uh, there are a few books uh, that I wrote here or um, edited, uh, co-edited with uh, Catherine Isbister that could interest you. And I'm happy to take questions uh, now. Thank you so much um, again for your attention.